In this set of PowerPoints, we're going to talk about uh, more procedures for decreasing behavior. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the use of extinction, timeout, and planned ignoring. We mentioned this earlier in the uh, presentation on differential reinforcement procedures, but when we use procedures to decrease behavior, we have to consider the intrusiveness of the intervention. Intrusiveness is defined by several things. First of all, how much of a person's freedom is restricted by using this intervention? Does it impact the person, uh, person's freedom or choices significantly or only to some minor degree? You also have to consider this with the severity of the problem behavior. In other words, to, does the nature of the problem justify the level of intervention that you're using? It would be very difficult to justify a very restrictive intervention with a relatively minor problem behavior. Also, you have to consider how much physical contact is necessary and how much is part of the intervention. And then finally, how aversive is this intervention? In other words, um, how unpleasant will the person find this intervention? And again, how much is, is justified given the nature of the problem? If you have a very serious problem behavior that is causing physical injury to the person or other people, um, to what extent is the intervention justified? In terms of types of interventions and how they correspond to levels of intrusiveness, as we said before, differential reinforcement is the least intrusive. It also should be the foundation for any kind of intervention you do. So if you're planning on using something more restrictive, for example, removal of desirable stimuli, at that same time, you should always be using differential reinforcement. You should always be reinforcing the person and increasing some behavior that you've selected. Extinction is more restrictive than just using differential reinforcement because it exposes the person to some level of risk. There's the extinction burst and there's the potential that it could be misused or used incorrectly. And then removal of something desirable is, should be recognized by you as type 2 punishment. So in other words, contingent on the person engaging in a behavior, you're taking away something that that person values. And the idea is, if this is aversive enough, the person is going to engage in this behavior less. This is a very common practice in schools. There is nothing inherently wrong or evil about it. The problem is, if you're doing that in the absence of teaching some appropriate behavior, it's not going to be effective for long-term behavior change. And I personally believe it's unethical to do a punishment procedure when you're not uh, very actively increasing a behavior at the same time. And then the most aversive and most restrictive intervention is presentation of aversive stimuli. And this is type uh, 1 punishment or positive punishment. There's some other terms there. Positive punishment and negative punishment are also called type 1 punishment and type 2 punishment. Those terms are used less frequently than positive punishment and negative punishment. I prefer positive, positive and negative punishment because it corresponds very well to uh, positive and negative reinforcement. If you understand negative reinforcement, you should understand negative punishment. Timeout as a procedure is very misunderstood. It's evolved into something that's very different from how it started out. The full title of this intervention is actually called Timeout from Positive Reinforcement. It's not the same thing as sending a kid to, uh, to a room by himself. That's possibly a form of timeout. But timeout means something else. It simply means that you're going to turn off reinforcement for that person given the occurrence of a behavior. So to use it effectively, first of all, you have to understand what is reinforcing for this student. What does this student value? And what is this student going to work to keep access to? Um, types of reinforcement. There are three broad categories. The first one is non-exclusionary timeout. Uh, 
which we'll talk about in a second, that involves using timeout in such a way that the student is not removed from an instructional situation. Yes, it's possible, and it's actually a very effective way to use timeout. And it was the first time, uh, first way in which timeout was used. Then there's exclusionary timeout, um, which involves removing a student from an instructional situation but not taking the person to a different room. And then there's the most restrictive, which is isolation exclusionary, and that's taking the person to a timeout room or to another environment. And we'll talk about each of these briefly. Extinction, before we get into timeout, has to do with withholding reinforcement from a behavior that's been reinforced in the past. Extinction should be part of any kind of behavior reduction procedure you're going to use because no intervention to decrease the behavior is going to be completely effective unless you reduce the amount of reinforcement the person gets from engaging in the problem behavior. To use extinction, you have to know what the reinforcer is. In other words, you've got to know the function of the behavior. What are the outcomes of the behavior that the person is trying to obtain? So what's the person after, and how can you prevent the behavior from paying off? Anyone who uses extinction should be aware of the extinction burst. The extinction burst is a temporary increase in behavior that occurs when you first remove a reinforcer. It's actually an indication that you were correct in identifying the reinforcer. And when you're used to this and you expect it, it's actually something that you're glad to see. Uh, when I worked with kids and I used extinction every day, I was always glad to see that an escalation in behavior because that let me know that I was on the right track, that I indeed had identified the reinforcer. If I tried to use extinction and I didn't see that, then I kind of questioned whether or not the, I had actually pre correctly identified the function of the behavior. But if I saw an initial increase that was really fast, uh, I knew I was on the right track. Usually it doesn't last very long. It depends on the student's reinforcement history as to how long it lasts. Remember, reinforcement uh, that is intermittent is more resistant to extinction. We know this because of reinforcement schedules. Like if you reinforce a person every third or fourth time, extinction is going to um, to be more difficult to obtain. A lot of problem behaviors are reinforced intermittently, so don't expect extinction is going to be a real quick way to change behavior. However, it's something that you should use along with reinforcement procedures. Also another aspect of extinction is spontaneous recovery. Spontaneous recovery happens when you've used extinction and then there's a period of time when the person is away from the setting. For instance, if you've got a kid and you've used extinction in a classroom, you go away for a holiday break, don't be surprised if when you come back you're going to see a return of a behavior that has previously gone through extinction. It usually doesn't last very long if you continue extinction. And every time the student's removed and comes back, spontaneous recovery is going to be there but the behavior will be at a lower and lower level until it's finally completely gone as long as you keep withholding reinforcement. We've talked before about resistance, the concept of resistance to extinction and it is something that is related to schedules of reinforcement. If you want a behavior to maintain when it's no longer being reinforced you want to gradually fade reinforcement or thin the schedule of reinforcement. People often don't think about problem behaviors being on schedules of reinforcement, but they are, and they're almost always on intermittent schedules of reinforcement. In other words, kids learn that if they engage in a challenging behavior uh, and they expect a payoff, they learn that payoff is not going to happen every time, but it may happen on average every fifth or sixth time. If a behavior has been maintained on a schedule of reinforcement like that, 
uh, it's going to be very hard for extinction to take place. So it's important that uh, you stick it out. And it's also important that you do other things. That's why extinction by itself is not an effective way to change behavior for a number of reasons. For one reason, it's going to take a long time to work. And more importantly, if you're only using extinction, you're not teaching the student an alternative behavior. You're not giving that individual another way to meet his or her needs. Let's talk briefly about the idea of planned ignoring. This is when you've decided that your attention is the reinforcer for a student's challenging behavior. You're not going to do this if your attention is not the reinforcer because it's not going to be effective. But if you've decided that your attention is the reinforcer, what part of the intervention that you want to do is you want to use something called planned ignoring. That means that you are not going to attend to the specific problem behavior when it occurs. However, you've got to have something that you are going to do. Um, and this is especially important if you want to communicate to classroom assistants or paraprofessionals or visitors in your classroom not to attend to a problem behavior. Give them something else to do. For example, say something like, when Woody does this behavior, you go and reinforce other students who are doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's usually what I would communicate to my paraprofessionals. It gave them something else to do. Also, it uses proximity praise and it uses modeling. And if this individual or student sees other kids being reinforced for doing something differently, um, it's likely to have a positive impact on their behavior. If the problem is that other kids are attending to some problem behavior, then you might have to do something differently. Remember the group contingencies we talked about? This is a good place to use them. You can have other kids earn reinforcers for not attending to the problem behavior of, of one of their peers. Sometimes this involves taking some time to do some modeling and role play and having kids practice this kind of behavior. In the beginning, it might seem a little awkward, but it actually can be very effective.